Have you ever wondered why some people are a natural beacon attracting our trust, our attention, and even our affection, whilst others we prefer to avoid? Well, besides personal taste, there are traits that apply across all humans that will have that effect. And today we're going to dive into why we are energized by some people and depleted by others. So if you want people to be drawn to you and have them feel that they want to be around you, if you want to be more effective in every role that you play, and if you want to actually just feel better, well, you might be looking to tap into what psychology calls the heliotropic effect. It's a term hijacked from biology and nature where plants grow towards the sun. They do this in such a consistent manner that's almost as universal as objects falling towards the ground due to gravity, just a bit slower. Plants grow towards the warmth and life-giving energy of the sun with an unyielding attraction, and we can be like a sun to others. To explain the heliotropic effect in detail, I have psychologist Dr. Harry Cohen on the show. He has also had a career as an executive coach and ran a successful restaurant and is the author of Be the Sun, Not the Salt. The book is a short and straightforward manual for living with purpose and kindness that uplifts others and draws them to you. And I found it a really uplifting reminder of what positive behavior looks like and a guide that we can all learn from. So if you have ever wondered how you can be more effective in communication whilst also being a kinder and happier person, this is the episode for you. That's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm -mm -mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset. Hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. I'm just going to start with asking you to explain the heliotropic effect when it comes to psychology. So the heliotropic effect was coined by a professor, Kim Cameron, University of Michigan Business School, to describe positive energizers in corporations. Specifically, the leaders in these corporations demonstrated behaviors that would make other people feel great. And what are these behaviors? These are expressed virtues that show compassion, gratitude, kindness, authenticity, vulnerability, dependability, just to name a few. It turns out the heliotropic effect is this tendency for all living systems to be drawn to energy, which sustains life, which is why a plant tilts towards the sun. Heliotropic effect. It turns out that these people are extremely powerful and effective for making other people want to work around them, want to be around them. We want to be married to these people. We want to be friends with these people. We love when people are heliotropic, when they're their best self. Conversely, I talk about salt on the roots, which is the de-energizer concept. These are people who do the opposite. They make people feel crappy. And if you have a lot of leaders and organizations that are de-energizers, or you're married to one or working around one, they're very, very depleting. Like metaphor, salt on the roots of the plant. Hence, the simple idea, be the sun, not the salt. Work as best we can on being uplifting and kind and virtuous, our best self more often, 1% more than you already do. So that's the idea. And so that's the heliotropic effect, this tendency to be kind and uplifting. And all of us are heliotropic at times, some more than others. It's not personality dependent. It's not gender dependent. It's not even age dependent. Interesting. I would feel like when you're talking about it, 
subjectively, I would say I could definitely recognize the heliotropic people in my life and that I would say it feels very personality linked. So what do you mean by saying it's not personality related and just very circumstantial? You can meet a perfect stranger for six seconds and you don't know their personality, but they smile at you and in that moment, they make you feel good. That's the heliotropic effect. You don't know them or their personality, but they held the door for you and they helped you in a small way or they smiled at you. That is a tiny aspect of the heliotropic effect. The key is to not walk around going, he's heliotropic, he's not. He's very heliotropic, he's not very. So you don't want to be pigeonholing people and you don't want to make people think, well, he's extremely heliotropic. Well, that might be the case, a very positive, energizing person. But then you're walking around with a clipboard evaluating people and putting people in the categories. The idea is that it's a helpful tool for we humans, all of us, to be more heliotropic. It's not something to categorize people as being personality or gender dependent, because then you're looking for, well, who is and who isn't like binary. It's on a continuum and it's moment to moment. I can be a complete jerk to you in the split second after I was nice to you. Well, I just salted your roots. And in that moment, my next right thing to do is to apologize, realize that I was a jerk and say, I'm sorry. That's an effort to be a better version of ourselves. Definitely. But more in the general debate of like, what even is personality then? Because you basically are the person that you are, but that is your actions. And if your actions then define your personality, you are just a more heliotropic person if you are always doing nice things and trying to make them smile. Well, be careful of always. Always be careful of always, yes. <laughs> right? We're human beings. Never say never. We are people since the beginning of time. For 5,000 years, the Stoics have been articulating these principles as have recent social psychologists when they understand human behavior. What is the deal with human behavior that seems to be universally true and has been true since time immemorial? So it's important not to get caught up in debate when you're debating you're less interested in deepening your understanding and more interested in making your point. Okay, I meant more like constructive, curious discussion around what even is personality as opposed to <laughs> let's argue about personality. But <laughs> So of the personality dimensions, there's five personality dimensions. People line up on those personality dimensions more or less extroversion, introversion, things like that. Well, Regardless of where you land on those traits, those personality traits, every single human being can lean to be a bit more heliotropic, a bit more kind. If you just use kindness or gratitude as a shorthand for heliotropic, you can use compassion, you can use curiosity, you can use generosity. They're all great virtues. Well, which is the best virtue? I mean, you're not going to, you know, that, that's not helpful. Do you think compassion or gratitude is better? Yes. But more importantly, am I kind and generous to you, Sam? Do I make you feel great in my presence? And I'm not trying to, with any technique, I'm just trying to be a good health and soul to you. And when I say just, it takes some effort to listen, to be present, to be aware, to be mindful. If I notice that somebody comes in the room and I notice that you have to attend to him, I'm not going to just keep on talking. I'm going to say, does somebody need your attention? That just seems considerate to me. Not complicated, but important nonetheless. Yes. And yet we still somehow manage to complicate all these things. So what are the mistakes people make that c cause them to complicate being a nice, compassionate person? Oh, I love the question. The question is everything. So there's lots of reasons we complicate things. Entropy is a force in nature which makes things go towards disarray. So how, why do we have to keep cleaning things up? Because there's a force that makes things messy. So keeping it simple is a discipline. And I think the force of complicating things is forever around us. So returning to paying attention to the present moment, any mindfulness exercise, it's not that easy. Agree. I mean, that's the paradox of mindfulness or meditation or staying in the present moment. It's not that easy to stay in the present moment. We want to go to the past and we want to go to the future. And there's a million reasons 
that will invite us there. Hey, did you hear about yesterday? What do you think about the world? Is it going to hell in a handbasket? It's tempting to go there. And a person, we don't recommend that. This mindset is about how to live every moment, every day, as best we can with a lot of forgiveness and self-compassion to be uplifting and kind and helpful to myself and others as best I can, more than I currently do, and do less salty behaviors. I've been reading a chapter. I wrote this book five years ago, and it's still real for me. I'm reading one chapter a day based on the day of the month. Today is March 12th. Chapter 12 is hold the salt, which is don't say everything that's in your mind, all the snarky comments. Just refraining from saying them is a discipline. And I like thinking about that today, March 12th. I sent out a little note to my team with my intention to practice that simple idea. Now, it's not like I'm done. Tomorrow I get to practice that again. So the discipline of this wonderful work is how can I be my best self more often with a little bit of effort? The blink of an eye is all it takes. Because I'm going to screw up, because I'm going to be thoughtless, inconsiderate, unkind, and every other salty behavior, I can then go, oops, forgive myself, apologize well, and do the next right thing. That's what I get excited about. And I think my gift to the world is the simplicity of this. But isn't there something more? Of course, there's a million things more, but can you be more kind to the person in front of you? I got an email from a guy in Lithuania this morning who said, I saw your article in Psychology Today, and there's a debate on the internet about, should you give up your seat to someone, and why should you, and what's wrong if you don't? And <laughs> and he asked me for my opinion, which I said, hey, the question is, well, how do we encourage others to be more kind? And I said, just by being more kind to yourself, you be the kind person, and don't worry about encouraging others. So I've rattled on enough, there's a quote that I often say when someone asks for a glass of water, don't hose them down. I have a few questions from that. One around what you just said around the concept of leading by example to spread kindness. When someone is negative as a leader or just in life in general, how do you tell them that they are a negative, energy sucking, terrible person to be around? <laughs> or do you just try and lead by example and that's the only way? Great question. And the answer is context dependent and relationship dependent. Here's what you do. You stroke your chin and you ask yourself a bunch of questions and you say to yourself, chapter one is do all the good you can. Chapter two is be helpful. I mean, oh, wait a minute. What would be the most helpful thing to do here with this person based on my relationship, based on their openness, based on the context? Boy, oh boy. I think the better course of action here is to say nothing. I think the better course of action here is to say something as soon as we're in a private setting. I think the basic course of action here is to really sit down with him or her in the appropriate setting and give him specific counsel with specificities of why what he did and how he did it was bad, ineffective, counterproductive, or the like. I'm not going to say a word to this guy because he has no interest in hearing it. I'm going to move on and fight another day. There's so different answers to that question. People should look in the mirror and stroke their chin and say, I know what to do here. And let your heart and mind guide you. What's the right thing to do? How do you talk truths to power? This leader is making a mess of this organization. Well, what's the best way to communicate with that to him or her? There isn't one way. There's a million ways. I, as an executive coach and a long time student of life and humans, have said to myself, I'm not going anywhere near that guy. He is unbelievably toxic, but he's not interested in being a better person. I'm not saying a word. Other people is like, when somebody tells me somebody's been a jerk, I say, well, have you spoken to him about it? No, I, I, I haven't spoken to him. Well, do you think you can and should? I don't know if I should. Well, let's talk it through. Our goal is to do some good. And if you can talk to someone in a way so they go, thank you. I didn't realize that my behavior was so off-putting. Appreciate that feedback. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for that whole run conversation. And if you can't achieve that, 
probably not a wise move to say anything. So if the question is a good one. What's your role? What's your responsibility? What's your job? Are you their father? Are you their friend? Are you their subordinate? Are you a perfect stranger? What's your role with them? With a kid at different ages, your job is to say certain things. But once that kid turns to, you know, I have two 32-year-old twin sons, I often stroke my chin and say things or don't say things to my sons because it's either not my place or it is my place. And I'm not saying I know the answer. Can you give me an example of when it is your place or not? Well, yeah. It's context dependent. Let's say I was with one of my sons and he didn't say thank you to someone who did something for him. And I was witness to it. I'd say, yeah, dude, I, I don't want to be a nitpicker, but I think you probably should have said thank you. And depending on how it's received, if I do it properly, he'll go, yeah, you're right. Period. I did good. If we were out dinner and he ordered my kids orders and they don't say please or thank you to the server, I watch my tendency and I bite my tongue. But in other professional settings, I still feel it's appropriate to remind my kids to reach out and like thank their mother or their grandmother or a professional that I put them in touch with. I'm always trying to figure out what the right thing to do is boundary wise, not step over that line. I'm not saying I get it right, Sam. I'm saying that I work at thinking about getting it right so that I can be the best possible influence with my grown sons, given that I still feel a certain responsibility to help them be wonderful people. They're already wonderful people. So I'm not bragging. I'm saying that I see how wonderful they are. And I also see they could be a smidgen more this, it's parenting disease, wanting more for your kids, which are not my kids. They're my kids forever, but they're 32. They're adults. Well, always value having a conversation about things, but yeah, I've they've been very able to ignore <laughs> that, that like feedback on things that sometimes I find out many years later, they were right. And sometimes. They want, and it's, it's fun. You gotta go through these things. And it really is the relationship dependent. Like, should you say something to someone? It really depends on your relationship and what is your desired outcome and how likely are you to be successful with that desired outcome? The changed behavior, the insight absorbed and appreciated. I'm not going to stand by and let evil flourish. What's your motive? Will you be successful? What should you do? I love those questions. A lot of it is how you do it. A lot of it is how you do it. That's right. And success is what you're looking for. You're not interested in being right. It's not necessarily about being right or like having all of your emotions necessarily heard or making the person feel bad. There's a hard one. Can you tell me about maybe a conversation you've had where you got it completely wrong and be specific and then how you learn from that and change your style? I've been married 44 years. And sometimes my tone in an argument is disrespect. It's not necessarily what I say, but I've got a, a self-righteous, I know it all. Don't you realize that it's just wrong. I have learned, don't make my wife feel wrong, bad, and stupid. Now that seems so damn obvious, but what if she is wrong? So. It's all about tone and respect and pointing out something that is, what do you try? And so I think that's the most, the most obvious is when I've been, you know, disrespectful in tone to my wife in a conversation. Would you say part of the heliotropic, well, embodying it would be apologizing a lot more and getting ownership of the, your mistakes? There's a chapter, which is one of my favorites, which is apologize well, which is make your apologies short, sweet, and meaningful. Don't overthink it. Don't say I'm sorry, but for whatever I did, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Learning to apologize. I was on a talk with an executive team. One of the leaders said, could you speak about apologizing? Well, it is such an important skill to learn. I am sorry for what I did. And what I said, and it won't happen again. That's a good apology. I feel bad. I have no excuse. A bad apology is 
for whatever I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry, but all of the ways that people don't apologize, I guess I'm sorry. What? You guess you're sorry? And so my point is yes to your question. Learning to apologize for our boo-boos is really a great skill, something we have to practice forever. I have to practice forever. It's the beauty of this work for me is that this is forever, never done, good work, sharpening our soul, like compound interest. You do a virtuous deed, you do a kind deed, one dollar a day is a lot of money. You do that for 30 years, it's a lot of money because of the compounding. You do a kind deed, a heliotropic deed, or two or three every day, you're going to become a wonderful human being. On the subject of negative emotions, how do you embrace the fact that you do need to be negative or like feel negative sometimes without being a downer, maybe? Such a great question. And here is the answer. Drumroll. This gets at the essence of toxic positivity. To understand, oh, there's a great woman from Harvard. She talks about this a lot. It's emotional authenticity. It's about identifying your feelings, naming your feelings, accepting of what you feel, but not laying them on other people or pretending that you don't feel what those negative feelings are. They're just feelings, even labeling negative feelings. You can feel angry. You can feel sad. You can feel disappointed. You can feel frustrated. You can feel depressed. They're all fine feelings. Knowing them, naming them allows you to have some distance from them so that they don't consume you and other people. You are not your feelings. You have feelings, but that's not who you are. You can understand it frees you from needing to identify. I am feeling sad is so helpful and real and allows someone else to step into your world and be there for you. It's wonderful. It's heliotropic to say and be sad. I'm feeling very, very sad versus I am sadness. You're not sadness. You can feel many th and being vulnerable and authentic in that expression is so pure and allows other people to connect with you in a very vulnerable, authentic way. That is being heliotropic. And so when we lash out at someone, that's not very heliotropic. So we don't want to be toxically positive to deny your sad or unhappy or what other people would call negative emotions and say, well, I can't feel those. That's not heliotropic. Just a misunderstanding of this concept. It's not about put on a happy face, smile to grieve and to feel sad and to feel lost and, and unclear. It's a beautiful, pure emotion. And when can someone express it, it allows someone else to just be there with them and for them without saying a word. Lovely. I hope people really understand that. Be the sun does not mean, well, don't feel sad. I'm not saying. I'm saying when you feel sad, only find a friend, hopefully, that you can say, I feel really sad. Will you allow me to be sad with you? Just be there for me and let the other person go, I got your back, man. That's what heliotropic behavior looks like. So on that subject of authenticity, there is, of course, the common phrase saying, fake it to make it. And then, because I had been going to ask you, I've been like, let's say I've read the book or listened to you and I've been like, yes, this is so correct. I want to implement all of these like actions and become a more heliotropic person and like be the sun for everyone around me. It's easy to read and agree with theories and be like, yes, everything is right. And then like walk straight into life and get everything wrong. How do you stop that from happening and actually do it? <laughs> There's a chapter in here. It might be the most important. Knowing isn't doing. None of this matters. None of what we're talking about matters unless you and I do it in the moment, every moment as best we can. 
Do you hold the door or hold your tongue? They're both good. Smile at a stranger. Show up on time. Do all the things that we are talking about as best you can. It is in the action that you learn anything. I was just reading this great book by General Mattis, his memoir, Call Sign Chaos, and he was quoting Aristotle. And Aristotle said, you learn courage or bravery by performing brave deeds. You don't study bravery. <laughs> you can't learn to serve from a book. You can't learn anything per se, but by doing. And it is in the doing that the learning is there. And then you get to do it again. What's the best way to communicate with my mother? Pick up the phone. On the subject of then historical figures, is there one person from history or philosophy that you think most represents what you've embodied in the book? I like to follow exemplars in real life, not mythical historical figures. Honestly, Buddha, Jesus, you know, they're people with families and responsibilities and jobs. The woman who wrote the foreword to the book, Mindy Allman, is such an exemplar. And I've met a few that are, well, just wonderful human beings who walk this earth. They're not saints. They're regular people. Nelson Mandela and, and Mother Teresa, I never met these people. They certainly like what I've read that they have done. But I, look at, I like to look at regular people, too, and say, what a lovely human being. They live in this world, and they walk among us, and they're quite delightful human beings. And that's my goal, to walk this earth and be a good person and have people say, what a nice person. And this guy was an uplifting soul. He helped me. Yeah, I definitely found myself realizing one day that I had a mate called Ed who was just super lovely. And I just found myself often asking myself, what would Ed do when I was like a teenager? And he was definitely a heliotropic person. Now that like, you look through these lenses. Back to your book. <laughs> if there was an extra chapter in your book that only appeared at midnight, maybe under a full moon, what secret advice would this chapter contain? If people ask me why I read the book and I tried to say as much as I could so I got not I never read another book. I I had my lace warp my every bit I want my children in the world to know I distilled into the essence and is there anything that I wish I would have said? I don't know yet, but maybe there is. There was a, a fellow I ran into in Costa Rica recently, and he had just come back from a moonlight surfing. It was six in the morning. He was out there four, eight, six, surfing at full moon. And we were standing and chatting, and he was such a vortex of goodness, was his expression. He's such a brilliant, generous, kind, uplifting fellow. He teaches a course in investing at Cologne, runs a hedge fund. He spent six months in Costa Rica and six months in Boston. Really inspiring, but what was most inspiring is he wasn't bragging about anything. He was sharing with me the feeling of being out of waves in community, waiting for the next wave. It wasn't like, oh, did I catch a good one? It was the feeling of waiting for one's way. The metaphor, being in community, not trying to achieve, not trying to get the wave, but being there in community, waiting for the right wave in the moonlight, one with nature, one with people, one with his craft, it felt so wonderful. And I just learned to surf, you know, I got up for 10 seconds and I just can't wait to spend more time with them, but also learn to surf and try to live my life out in that space of waiting for the right. Is it this way? No. Is it this way? No. I just like the image and the feeling and the aspiration to live my life for that. So in the modern day, we're feeling like we're trying to ride five waves at once and you're like, we can all just calm down a bit and just enjoy what we're doing. And like, I'm certainly deliberately doing less. Like I run this podcast for seven years and also at least three other things at the same time. But this year, all I do is run a podcast and it's so nice <laughs> not doing anything else. Like I'd, I spent some time last year, I lived in the pool for three months as a mountain guide, which was sweet and managed to keep running this. But now I'm like, yeah, I think I'm just going to grow the podcast and like 
moving to Portugal with my girlfriend so I can do more surfing. And I'm like, yeah, I have time to read the books of people that I'm interviewing before I meet them and just geeking out and getting deeper into psychology and making a better podcast. And I'm like, yeah, this is really nice. I don't need to run some crazy giant business or all the other things that I would like to sort of do. But actually, I'm like, it mostly just stresses me out trying to do all these things and not doing much is super cool. Where do you live? Where are you broadcasting? Right now I'm in the UK. I had to come back for an operation, but we are about to move back to Portugal. We were living in Amsterdam last year, but yeah, Portugal is, is the plan. Portugal is your going to be home. Yeah, going to be home here. from next month, which Great. is nice. Cool. And then what is one of your earliest ever memories? doesn't have to be the earliest, just an early memory that distinct and memorable. Obviously, because otherwise you wouldn't remember it. <laughs> this isn't a good one, but it was a very real, like trauma has a way of sticking in our heads. I was walking home from kindergarten with these really cool, tight jeans that had buttons instead of a zipper, and I couldn't get them off in time, and I wet my pants. I remember going to school feeling really cool because I had these cool jeans and feeling just horrible coming home with my wet pants. I had to be five years old, so that's in Walter. But I think it has some power in a pure ego. Look at me. Are these pants cool? Not so much, buddy. <laughs> I, I like the question. It's interesting. Like, it's usually something to do with kind of some feeling of shame or like a strong emotion, generally speaking, where you, it's usually when you get something wrong. Like, I remember jumping on my dog's tail and it crying and being like, maybe I shouldn't jump on my dog anymore. Like when I was young, I had another one. I put a pencil under my dad when he sat down on the front seat of the car. It's a cartoon. You're like, look at this. I'm going to put a little pencil. Won't it be funny? And he was like, ow, the hell did you do? It's bleeding. Like, what? <laughs> but it was literally a cartoon. Yeah, interesting. So good to hear. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Again, you don't have to necessarily choose the best example, but do you have an example of one of the kindest things that someone has done for you? And yeah, it doesn't have to be the kindest thing. It can just be a recent kind of thing that happened for you. I was trying to take my sons to the national championship that the University of Michigan was in the United States as a college national championship game. And there, all the flights were canceled and a friend let me uh, NetJets membership to fly in a private jet, make sure that I spent time with my son. It was extremely nice. Like, really? Thank you. That's cool. Okay, then. Okay, nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. My absolute pleasure, and I would love to have another conversation with you, but that's up to you. you Tell me much. if you want to. We'll make it happen. Nice. Well, thank you for Harry coming on the show. I found his concepts really did chime with Stoicism, Buddhism, and of course, the growth mindset. And it's always fascinating to learn things that we maybe already know or have an idea about, but from a different perspective. As I was originally trained as a biologist myself, it was curious to see a concept from biology applied to human behavior. And as he said, the most important part of any of these things is the doing. It's easy to listen to a podcast or read a book and agree with everything whilst accidentally forgetting to genuinely implement it. So I would challenge you today to reflect on one thing that resonated with you and find a time and a place where you can genuinely do something about making it better. Pick an action and commit to changing that one behavior, whether it's being more authentic with an apology or kinder with the way you treat others, or going out of your way to promote someone. I'm sure there's something that you can do, so write it down and get it done. And if the episode resonated with you, then please do send it to a friend, as that is how we grow. If you're feeling a wave of kindness and joy, then please ride that feeling all the way to the review and comment section on your podcast app of choice, and share some love. It is, of course, a big help for the podcast. And finally, don't wait to start living your life. It is easy to keep those things that we really want to do on hold until we achieve some goal we set ourselves. 
that is a recipe for being a spectator in life. So get involved and dive into being who you want to be. As always, be kind to yourself, and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too. (laughs) 